Hello and welcome to the 116th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 10th of April 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week I'm delighted to welcome Professor Nick Potts of Solent University to talk about the problems of equilibrium theories. The second part of this interview where we delve deep into a paper of Nick's about a possible synthesis between post-Keynesian and MMT approaches with the TSSI of Marx will be released in a couple of days as a patron-only episode. Speaking of patrons, I have the new patron Zylon Dimov to thank. If you liked today's episode and want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month or under $1 an episode, You get two Patreon-only episodes every month and the right to vote on the next Reading Group series. If you don't have any spare though, just spread the good commie word and give me a nice review over on iTunes. Okay, let's join the discussion. I suppose the big thing that I want to say is, is that it's about having a theory of value. The real thing about value is that In the mainstream, it's always assumed to be a physical quantity. It always boils down to a physical quantity. And the only other prices you think are about is relative prices. And if you ever want to say, think about the value of money, you're always thinking about it in terms of how many goods and services you can buy with that money, right? So conventionally in economics, and this carries over to post Keynesian economics, as far as I can see. It doesn't really have underlying it much of a theory of value. Because when you actually try to pin things down, they say, well, what's inflation? Well, they just say it's, well, it's just a change in the price of goods and services. So goods and services are more expensive or they're cheaper. Now, obviously, In all common sense terms, goods and services don't stay the same from year to year. They change. Technological, you know, the development occurs. A car is not the same as a car 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. The actual physical objects are are just absolutely not the same, right? And then, like, like, how do you determine the relative values between them? Well, you've then got to go on the relative price between the two of them you know, between the different objects. And so so any price change, relative price change, suddenly changes, um, you know, suddenly changes everything. So I think that the only place that standard, you know, value concepts work in economics is actually in very imaginary restricted scenarios. And essentially what they don't do is they don't get away from essentially the commodities, the objects, and thinking about profit in terms of how many objects do you have more than the objects you put in. Now, obviously, some people like Scraffer, they make this very explicit that it's a, like that, that, that they are it's a physicalist based approach, whereas another approach is even if it doesn't necessarily appear to be a physicalist-based approach, the lack of a theory of value always does make it so. Now, this completely contrasts, I think, to what Marx does, where he says, well, look, what is our value concept? Well, our value concept is that everything gets produced by human beings, ultimately. And like so when we're thinking about value, it's abstract social labour time. and this is not the same as nominal price. This is not the same as real terms, as it's conventionally understood in economics. It's not the same as physical terms. It's a value concept which is different to all of these things. And where it's been messed up, in a sense, in terms of Marx and Marxist economics, is that the long confusion and debate over the transformation process starting in the early 20th century, well, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, leads to this creation of 
a version of Marxism which is corrected in the bulk of its tradition into a simultaneous dual system where you've got two concepts of value in that. You've got value in terms of hours of labor and you've got you've got price which is considered to be in units of money you know and they're considered to be separate things and when you calculate things using these sort of concepts you end up not being a, being able to escape physical terms i've got something which comes from an article which i like wrote absolutely ages ago now i've not got it on this computer but but the you know but the essential point is is that you can calculate something which is exactly like the same you know like where you've got the same physical quantities in your model the same amount of, of labor time being like worked in your model but if you like calculate the thing simultaneously all in one period which essentially means you go back and revalue the inputs at the same value as the outputs right Everything proxies down to physical terms, exactly the same as it would in any standard economic model. And Steedman worked this out as early as 1977, and he wrote down, "Well, look, the Marxist like theory of value is out of date. It's redundant. It can be proxied by physical terms. It's of no value to anybody. Nobody should like study it. Nobody should take any interest in it." And it's really this huge false red herring like which comes from assuming that marx's theory has to be put into a normal equilibrium simultaneous treatment and then you turn around and you find out oh it doesn't work as marx says and it's and I, I was first taught this myself at the London School of Economics back in the late 80s. And like, so I was like going through it and I was thinking, well, there's not a lot of difference between this so-called Marxist economics and like the mainstream economics I've been learning for the last three or four years, because it gets incredibly difficult, overcomplicated and confusing. It has massive amounts of maths in. And... We're just like really talking about different equilibrium situations, and that's all it is. Now, this to me, like, was Marxist economics. And when I read it, I rejected it and thought it's not worth doing. So it wasn't until somebody actually presented to me an idea of like treating Marx's theory as a sequential theory, where you imagine that you have a period, and then like there's a process of circulation, exchange of commodities, then you have another period. Then you've got a process of circulation in another period. But it's not until we do, that it gets presented to me as not an equilibrium, well, not, well, simultaneous equilibrium construct, but a temporal matter. And, and then, like, that value is not a matter, it's a, you know, there's not two systems of values, one in price, one in labor time. Like, like there's actually value as a concept, abstract social labor is the concept it's the one concept but it can be measured in either hours or money but they're not separate things so this is what you know the temporal single system interpretation of marx taught me that like that value marx's concept of value is just simply not the same as what i've been presented as marx's concept of value and mm -hmm. you can spot it because if anybody's writing and they use the term Marx's labor theory of value, they're not really talking about Marx's labor theory of value. They're talking about the corrections in the long tradition going back to Borkovich, which are essentially more to do with modern economics than like anything that Marx did. Whereas if you hear somebody write Marx's theory of value determined by labor time well that's the terms and the words and the phrases he used and they're referring most likely to a concept which is um not bound to simultan you know simultaneousness or equilibrium and it's a different concept and it's the very fact that you can use exactly the same model with the same physical quantities and inputs and everything else and on one model the supposed 
measuring like labor time perfect is perfectly proxied by physical quantities and then in a different model calculated like um, by the tssi approach then the value magnitudes are not the same as the physical ones so i mean something like the famous akisho theorem which supposedly like ruled out marx's tendency for the falling rate of profit to occur essentially are physicalist theories they talk about a value concept which is equivalent to a physical concept where they're where it's comparing a physical surplus to the notion of the inputs as a physical amount and indeed you can have labor saving technological change which creates a bigger physical surplus and in physical terms creates increase in the profit rate but the point is is that it misses the argument because marx's argument was based on his theory of value which is not physically and you recalculate the model according to a temporal and non-dualistic tssi way and lo and behold for exactly the same numbers marx's profit rate will fall because value is not a physical concept in marx well one thing to say would be that if you are abstracting away from time and doing things in an equilibrium manner it's the absolute opposite of of a thing that's supposed to be based on time it couldn't possibly end up in anything other than a physical quantities relation yeah but you can achieve the same result remarkably enough right even if you do have time something like say david laberman like um in 2000 in research and political economy was debating with andrew Kleiman and alan freeman and duncan foley was getting involved and like so he like had something which had the real existence of time but the point was he was still tied to essentially a physicalist point of view just saying well it, you know like we need to be forward looking when we think of profit rates so we go back and re recalculate like the inputs at their replacement cost at the end of like the production period so you can be sequential and still get the same result but but the thing is you're still going back and you're revaluing stuff which in a sense you shouldn't revalue because if you're a business or a firm at the start of the production period you put forward your capital and it costs you so much money and when you get to like you know you know when you get to the end right then you make so much profit and you think well how much profit did i make compared to how much money i had tied up in this process you don't go back and say well oh because things are cheaper now i can go back and pretend i paid less for my inputs than i really paid for them no real firm ever works like that i mean you see what i'm saying it's funny because we were saying you were saying that you had gone through university doing economics and stuff and you were so you've been trained in the kind of equilibrium approach that it it was very strange for you to get your head around the kind of sequential say tssi approach well it, for me not a trained economist the idea to this day when i when i look at the equilibrium mathematics it seems extremely alien to me and hard for my brain to see how how it could have been taught that marx w should be treated in this way well i mean i mean the obvious answer to that is because like takes out all the really radical or challenging things in his theory such as well the really important one i think is that what marx clearly says in capital is that the system defeats itself and the way that the system will ultimately defeat itself on a recurrent basics on a phoenix like basis is this tendency for the rate of profit to fall which follows from um, the behavior of firms in competition with each other in capitalism where each one seeks to put down their own individual cost of production below the others so they introduce technological change which might cut back on the amount of workers comparatively they have and they increase the amount of constant capital the amount of machinery and raw material input which they're using so if you accept like like marx that uh, the profit rate is determined by the total surplus value extracted by from workers then 
if like in total the total surplus value extracted by workers is the same or not growing by very much and all the firms collectively in their search for profit are putting forward more and more constant capital then you're ending up with the top of the profit rate s growing slowly if not at all and then the bottom of the profit rate equation constant capital plus variable capital you know wages that's growing much faster so you've got this tendency for the rate of profit to fall right and marx goes on and he explains like um he says well look it might seem odd it might seem stupid well if all the capitalists know that by investing in technology you know investing in more means of production to reduce unit prices you know technological change if they knew that they were like reducing the overall profit rate available in the system then why do they do it and he answers that question by by saying well look they don't think like that because each firm is in competition with all the other firms in the industry so if i become more efficient compared to everybody else through introducing technological change i will capture a surplus profit from the less efficient firms in the industry so those who do best at applying the technology and the change and lead the way will appear to make profit through their machines and technology but they're not generating it themselves they're transferring it from those who don't do as well who fall behind and like obviously this process explains the tendency to concentration and bigger bigger capitals in each industry etc etc so it sort of fits in a really quite basic level with the way that firms actually behave and like compete with each other and see things happen and i think one of the like the best places that this is explained outside of marx is in joseph's you know is in joseph schumpeter right where his notion of competition is creative destruction and you go forward and you make your competitors fail you devalue like, their out of date machinery you, you know you push them out of the market you benefit at their expense I've always thought that Joseph Schumpeter, who would be an Austrian, living where he did, when he did, must have like read Marx's argument about how firms compete and like what happens, and decided, well, I'm not very, I don't particularly like the value theory, but the, you know, but all the general idea about the way the firms compete. Oh, I, you know, I agree with that. I mean, who knows? There might have been common like sources which both Marx and Schumpeter like might have read about people practically observing competition even. this real world notion of competition right seems to be totally absent from economics but it's in marx and it explains this tendency for the profit rate to fall which means that even if the capitalists are allowed like full reign and there's not resistance by workers but that just a normal operation of the system endogenously in itself means that it's going to fail there's going to be the need for some crisis at some point and for a restoration of the profit rate through bankruptcies and collapse of firms and what marx calls moral depreciation which is the fall in the price of machines and land and raw materials etc it's so crucial in marx and that's why he says his tendency for the fall falling rate of profit is his most important law because it's saying well look capitalism defeats itself there's no way that this system can be stable now if you have got an analysis which says no way can this system be stable it defeats itself then how does that fit in in an economics department in a university funded by a government who everybody is involves interest is to say well actually if only we got things right the economy can run beautifully i mean do we really want to say well look our society's got this fundamental instability built into it and we've got and we can do nothing at all about it because that's the conclusion which comes from marx and it's a huge conclusion nick you you teach kind of in a business school and accountancy stuff how squarely does all this tssi approach fit with 
real accounting practice? And I don't know. I don't know. Um, because although I teach accounting and students, I, my actual knowledge of accounting is not very good. I did like years before when I left university because I didn't want to be an academic or anything. I ended up working in the health service because I didn't want to work for a bank or anything. And I've got a degree and a master's from the LSE. So what do you do? So I ended up working in the health service. right? And I remember like they were trying to teach me accountancy in the health service, but I like, I couldn't get it, you know, at the time. And like, that's the only time that anybody ever tried to, to, you know, to teach me. So now what I get is sort of scraps, which I see from the accountants and I get from the accountancy students. But the scraps are enough to make me realise that that fundamentally, what well, at least what they're attempting to do is very similar to Marx, because what they're trying to do, for example, is they're trying to not get hung up on the form of value, realising that value can change depending on if it's in money or in stocks or in inputs or in everything else. And so they're trying to track a value flow through a firm. Now, you know, they do it on a pure money concept of value with no real fundamental way to like adjust for inflation other than just to take the standard estimates of inflation, which, as I said before, are just based on like how many goods can you buy, which is which is a physicalist concept of value. So they don't have much concept of inflation, but what they do know is that you start with a certain amount of value of your capital and then like the value of that capital grows and the difference is profit. And they do get that. You know, I mean, I should do some accounting, really. I mean, I've, you know, I mean, I mean, I think it's also important to like to get into like some of like the stuff on credit creation and banks and stuff like that, because it seems to be the way that that people like say in MMT, like Warren Mosler, it seems to be their practical experience and their more accounting background, which has made them think about things in a different way to economists. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. You know the the concept concept of the of a kind of an accountancy or a fl- maybe even a, a flow kind of a basis for understanding money yeah. creation. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know it's like, and it it really is. I mean, there's lots of difficulties. I mean, I mean in my work, right? I've got to make like very clumsy assumptions. So, like for instance, I assume that there's a period of production, and then like there's a period of circulation, which I normally assume just happens immediately at the end of production. And then you restart with another period of production. Now, obviously, like production and like the sale of commodities occurs alongside each other. So I have tried to model that, like this period's output being like circulated over the next period of production and to try to get to build in some more like you know, to try that as an alternative way to modeling production and consumption. Now, I know that Alan Freeman is very keen to like try to move to a, you know, away from the period completely to like move to continuous time and not have, in a sense, discrete period analysis. Because period analysis in itself obviously is just a assumption. It's a simplifying assumption. In reality, firms produce, sell, the processes overlap. Sometimes circulation lasts longer than production. Sometimes circulation lasts not as long as production. The whole thing is just completely like a mismatch and a like continuous messy flow. And I think what Alan's trying to ultimately get at, well, well, in that case, well, why don't we just like think about it in this in continuous time and just like go for in a sense we can get right down to any particular moment and not have to worry about the period now i'd like not quite sure how we do that but i find what he's doing interesting and i wish there were a lot more people seriously trying to think about like you know the challenges of doing this sort of thing outside of these conventional restrictions which we just live and breathe in economics so like the tssi is based around this idea of you know kind of model the models of it are based on these like period of production 
uh, selling at the end input to the new period of production going and you know so it's like a single cycle you know selling yeah, at the I mean, end time. yeah i mean you know that is a sim you know that is a simplified way that we normally present it but like we know that that is is just our way of like abstractly simplifying and presenting the story i mean it it rings quite true to the way that Marx um, simplifies and presents the story when I read Capital. But of course, when you read Capital, what you get is you get um, like a very thorough and interesting discussion of all the different like elements in capitalism. And, you know, and if you get anything approaching a model, it's like Marx says, well, look, let's just assume da, 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 and let's like set it up like this and let's just do this focusing on what we vary here whilst we hold everything else constant. But he never actually says, well, look, here is my grand overall model of my entire theory, which I've now put in like equations to cover every aspect of it. And now I'm going to use this model to simulate the economy or to say what's going to happen next. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, it's more of a, of a logical thing, but again, it, He's doing this, not influenced by the explosion of this practice of equilibrium modeling, which is maybe starting when he's writing, but isn't really going to like dominate until after he's dead. You know, and it's when people after Marx has died try to squeeze Marx's ideas into something which looks like modern economics, as I said earlier, that they suddenly lose all of his ideas. It's handy that. Well, it, it seems kind of very likely to me that if you wanted to get rid of a of a of a labor theory of value, you would go towards abstracting from time. Well, yeah, I mean, like you know, I mean, yeah, maybe, like you know, yeah, absolutely. As I said, like I think it's losing sight of the ultimate thing, which is a firm puts forward money, like you know, like does something, ends up hopefully with more money than it started that's you know like that's a, you know that's profit you know i mean like it's it's as simple as that it's just like trying to remember that that's what's going on i mean i mean when you do macroeconomics like mainstream macroeconomics i did it for years and like i kept on asking the teachers where's the profit rate <laughs> what's going on and like and the only thing i'd ever get as an answer and i suppose it was that logical was where the interest rate is, you know, the interest rate is actually the profit rate. That doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't, but like, you know, like, <laughs> but like, but when you've got these very highly abstract models, right, they don't have profit rates in them. And then you think, well, what is like determining like the surplus? You know, so, you know, so what's the closest thing to it? Well, it's actually the interest rate, which they relate back to time preference. It's a bizarre business, like mainstream economics. So, Nick, let's see if we can jump into this paper that you sent me, and oh, Jesus, it must be a year ago, about, let me, let me read out its title, the title that I have for it here. What Marx and Kaleski slash post-Keynesians do not share and why this is not a barrier to their learning from each other to their mutual advantage. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, on the podcast, I've had like an awful lot of TSSI people and an awful lot of M and T slash post Keynesian people, and I've I, I think there's a synthesis to be made there from the post Keynesian slash M and T insights in how money creation works. That's my own personal opinion. As as a, I consider myself a Marxist and not a MMT or a post Keynesian, your paper here is like one of the one of the few things I've come across that's actually trying to look at the insights and trying to understand how they apply to Marx. From my point of view, it's one of the few things I've come across. How did you get into this stuff? Well, I mean, as I said, in terms of my interest in. Um... You know, I mean, I've been, you know, I've always been interested in inflation because I don't know, perhaps it's my age. It's like I was brought up as a kid and like everybody was going on about inflation. Then we've got Margaret Thatcher, like, and everything's about reducing inflation and like everything else. And like, 
so so inflation is all you know all the time it's ever so important it's ever so important it's ever so important and then when i like studied economics i found out that money was neutral so logically it made no difference what the inflation rate was so like you think well that's a bit bizarre so like i've always like been like thinking well like yeah but it doesn't quite add up like the whole the whole idea the whole inflation like you know like price determination stuff well it doesn't really add up and then like you get you know like you get into like as i say the tssi and you realize that the that the unit of value is labor time and you realize that that actually if you're going to follow marx's value theory that what matters is, is like um you know what you what's inflation is how much one hour of labor time represents in money so like you know and, and then like it's got other implications so for instance you know because you recognize in marx that commodities cheapen because of like competition between firms and technological change it's sort of saying to you well look even if prices stayed the same right then in actual fact you've got inflation because one hour of labor time is going to be like represented by like more money because like i mean let's say you've you know you've just got one commodity if it's like priced at one pound right okay and it's got one hour of labor in it right and that's the whole economy right okay now so one hour equals one pound you know one hour of labor time equals one pound right now if you get technological change and now the whole economy is the same commodity which is still priced at one pound but now it only takes half an hour of labor to make right then like if you keep prices the same then like um the monetary expression of labor time is two pounds per hour so there's been like you know like 100 percent inflation like in terms of like um how much money represents an hour of labor time and nominal prices haven't changed at all so the whole issue about how you would even measure inflation immediately came to the fore when i was doing um you know when i got into understanding through the tssi that marxist concept of value was not a physical concept of value so you know, so i've got an interest in inflation i've got from from the tssi this understanding of the monetary expression of labor time which was pioneered by tssi authors and then you've got the question of creation of money now there right i first came across endogenous creation of money not through mmt or anything but through again reading marx because he talks about how firms granting each other commercial bills of exchange creates a new form of money this credit that they've granted each other and it can be spontaneously created by firms according to their wishes so you get this idea through reading marx that that perhaps credit money is a fundamentally different thing than like any other form of money so in a sense endogenous creation of money i'm getting that off the of marks and then like you get people like basil more like you know horizontalism versus something else or something like with somebody else and i started to come across these post keynesian things which were saying about essentially how banks could lend any amount of money at a particular interest rate and they're like not being constrained in any way by this sort of mainstream ideas of money multipliers etc etc so you get some sense there that like you know about this process in terms of banks but it wasn't until um, my colleague simon Mama, who i mentioned to you earlier started to read about this in more depth because he was the guy who, who was teaching banking to the accounting students and stuff like that i you know i wasn't so like he starts reading about this and he starts bringing it to me maybe like 10 15 years ago and i'm beginning to get you know thinking oh it's uh, yeah i sort of sort of see the logic of what they're saying there 
And then, like, he goes and, like, and leaves and works at Chichester. i got to take over teaching about money creation and how banks work. And almost at exactly the same time, I get Phil Armstrong turn up saying, like, hey, I want to do a PhD and I'm an MMD person, like, you know, and, like, so, like, suddenly it all comes together and I'm, like, reading all this concrete stuff about banking and, like, for instance, reading the Bank of England report on how banks work in 2014 about credit creation, about loans, like, create money and repayment destroys money. And things which I'd been reading, but not really been put in forefront in my mind and seen people like Randall Ray talk about as long ago as 1998, suddenly they all come into sharp focus and I'm thinking about them. And it's all coming together. And also, I'm like, got this sort of long term frustration with a lot of people who like, talk, you know, who do about money with Marx, who like, keep on like seeing me getting confused and saying well like oh it's a gold standard it's a gold standard it's a gold standard it's gold it's commodity money it's commodity money it's gold and they've got i think mosley is a really good example of this whereas he's got his modern macro monetary theory sort of well he's got his marx version of of macro theory where he produces a model which if he assumes there's a commodity money it just determines like the price of everything and like that's that done. So there's no inflation, but there's changes to value of money changes. But he's describing a world which clearly doesn't exist because we don't use the commodity money. And then when he switches over and says, oh, I'm going to use valueless money, in his models, it just turns out to have the same result as a quantity theory of money. His money is neutral. So like, I'm frustrated with, in a sense, on the Marxist side, after stuff you read on money or anything to do with it, Seems to be endless like debates back about gold and stuff like that, which just seems completely irrelevant. And at the same time, you've got, you know, armed with an understanding of how you would calculate the rate of inflation, what the unit is that like is actually inflating. And you're getting from post-Keynesianism and from MMT, you're getting stuff on credit creation. And I'm thinking, well. All of this has got to come together somehow to be able to create a understanding of all these processes, which fits with what Marx is doing. Because I don't really think if you go through Capital Volume 3 and you read the, something like three or 400 pages on the credit system, etc., which he has in that volume, it's obvious that he does think like that this spontaneous creation of credit has got a huge role to play in effect in prices, in effect in like booms and slumps, the timing of booms and slumps, like the like the way they might outbreak and all of these different things. It's just that it's a bit scattered because it's like um, not finished. It's just edited after his death and put together. So to me, it's always been what I've been interested in is combining Marx with uh, an understanding of the world where we don't have a commodity money. We have a variable inflation rate. That's where I got to first. And that led me into thinking about how banks work. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Music